I don't know if you know the reason that he did the workout at 4 a.m., but it parlays perfectly into your new no. book, you know, okay. Just Do One More. Okay. The reason Kobe does that, he understands that e even the most aggressive uh, uh, players in the NBA, they're going to get in two workouts a day during mm -hmm. the offseason. Uh, first one is usually around 9 or 10 a.m., and then they'll take a lunch break, and then they'll come back at 3 or 4. So his mindset was, if everyone else in the league is going to be doing two workouts a day, I'm going to do three, because I'm going to do one more than they're doing. And the only way I can squeeze that in is if I get up and do it at 4. So when he's coming home from his first workout, his competition is just waking up to go in for their first workout. So then he's doing his second workout while they're doing their first. And then it's it's the compounding interest effect of yes. if I do this every single day in the off season for not just years, but in his case, decades, he said, no one will ever catch me because every time I, I wake up, I'm going to do one more than you're doing. You'll never catch me. And I think that's part of what gave him that, you know, that Mamba mentality. You ask him the day before, can I come watch this workout? Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh, yeah, four o'clock. And it wasn't 4 p.m. It was 4 a.m. <laughs> yes. But you, I'll, I'll let you share this, but you're like, well, I'm going to impress this guy and get there early. Yeah. So there's a 4 a.m. workout, but what happens? Tell him what happens when you get there and you get there early. Well, yeah, and I arrived today early because I believe I in making did. a good first impression. Yeah. And I believe that getting places early is, is a sign of respect to the person that you're going to meet. And, you know, as a young coach, I'm thinking, what could be better than me leaving my mark and impressing Kobe? So if he thinks he's working out at four, I'm going to be waiting for him at the gym at, you know, 3.30 a.m. Yes. And he is going to be blown away. Mm -hmm. And instead, I arrive at the gym and can see the lights already on, can hear sneakers squeaking and a ball bouncing from the parking lot. I walk in at 3.30 in the morning. He's going through a warm up. He doesn't even count that as part of his workout. Gosh, that's so he's doing that at 3.30 before his workout actually started with his trainer at four. And Bro. Crazy. And he went on for a couple hours, again, sticking to the basics and just drilling down. And, you know, he's one of those guys that really understands the concept. You know, if you want to perform well in front of millions, then you have to be willing to put in millions of reps when no one else is watching, which is how we define the unseen hours. Uh, I really believe that success in anything, e even the success of your podcast is predicated on the due diligence and the research that you do on each guest before the mics go hot. Very true. And, and yeah. that's the unseen hours. And that's what a lot of people, they don't see that the standard is different right so like this idea that a 4 a.m. workout look let's just be really honest you and I you know the NBA a lot better than I do but I know professional sports and most dudes are coming home around 4 a.m. in the NBA oftentimes right <laughs> not starting not having a workout at 4 a.m. and then to know that no it's not 4 a.m. he was you're there at 3 30 he'd already been warming up for 25 or 30 minutes before there's just a different standard yeah. I think with the elite performer I think a, a elite mother has just a little bit different standard than an average mother I think an elite executive they just set a different culture of standards around that's got to be part of it how does one do those things and then still not fry or burn out what would be a couple of things that you would say burnout is the result of misalignment between the work that you're doing and your core values, your interest, your fascination, and the, the meaning behind your work. Okay. I don't know your daily schedule, but I imagine it's pretty immense. You've been I imagine, here today. Yeah, right? I imagine yeah. you work a lot of hours, I but do. the reason you're not approaching burnout is you find meaning and purpose in those hours. You're being of service to millions of people, so that's why you don't experience burnout. If those two things start to splinter, if you were working 60, 70, 80 hours a week for work that you didn't enjoy, work you didn't find fascinating, work you didn't feel was making a contribution to other people's lives, work that you didn't find meaningful, you would write, you'd be on the cusp of burnout. And that's what a lot of people are experiencing. So it's not just the long hours, it's when long hours are not congruent with what it is that lights you up and fills your bucket. I'm holding myself to an even higher standard. Mm. I mean, I don't know that anything would make me more sick to my stomach than for someone to see me doing something that is not in alignment with what I preach from stage or what I put in my books. And, yeah. and, and I don't hold myself to a standard of perfection. Mm. I'm fallible, mm -hmm. I make mistakes, I have lapses in judgment. Mm. But generally speaking, the fact that I'm putting this content out there, uh, I wanna hold myself to that. I've absolutely experienced stress, stagnation, and burnout in my life several times. So I wanted to get to the root of it because I figure if it can help me, certainly somebody else out there is going through similar difficulties and challenges. So I want to offer that to them. And, and the last thing I'll say on that is with any of this stuff, I'm not speaking from a place of mastery. Th this is all stuff that I'm still working on, but the book is what holds me to that standard. So when I find myself getting momentarily stressed, I actually smile, have a kind and compassionate conversation with myself and just say, Alan, remember, you, you write about this, you speak about this, now you need to live it. And, and that tongue in cheek kind of self-compassion actually gets me through those times. The most important about 
important part about focus, and, and we and I know you know I've listened to every single one of your shows, and one of the common themes with most of your guests is everyone understands the importance of being in the present moment. Yeah. And understanding that you know if we're dragging stuff from the past or we're getting anxious about the future, then we're tending to lose focus in the present moment, and yeah. that's the first thing that's going to heighten stress. You know, uh, of all the different definitions I've heard from stress, the one that resonates most with me is from Eckhart Tolle, you know, modern day philosopher, who basically says stress is the desire for things to be different than they are in this present moment. So the very first step to lowering stress is mere acceptance, is saying that what's going on around me right now is outside of my control, and I might not like it, and it might not be my preference, but this is what is going on right now, and our stress doesn't come from events and circumstances. Our stress comes from our response or our resistance to those events and circumstances. And uh, when I heard that, it was like a, a, a light bulb went off. And, and I find that incredibly empowering and liberating because that means we are no longer uh, victims or puppets to the uh, events and circumstances happening in the world. Mm. We get to choose our response. That's right, man. And that, that, to me, that means we always have the keys to the car. I often say that it's not the events of our life that define us, it's the meaning we attach to the event. And often that meaning comes from the question we ask ourselves about it. What does this mean? So I feel like, you know, take a guy like Kobe or Durant, Steph, you, an executive who's at a platform at a high level, an entrepreneur, when there's, you know, in Kobe's case, there's six sections left and Jackson draws up a play that's going to come to Kobe. That event that's about to happen, he attaches a meaning that I have an opportunity to rise. I have an opportunity to win this game where someone else might attach a meaning to it of, what if I miss the shot, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the meaning we attach to the event. You pointed at me when I said that, so I want to make sure you get a chance to comment on it. Oh, you, you nailed it perfectly. So much insight right there. It's the difference between being nervous about taking that shot mm -hmm. and being excited because it is an opportunity to showcase all of the mornings you were in the gym at 4 a.m. making hundreds of thousands of shots every off season. He, he revels in those types of moments. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know you've said so many times on your your previous episodes um, that life is, is happening for you, it's not happening to you. And that's really what this is talking about. It's saying that, yeah, things are going to happen in the world that we don't necessarily like and they're not our preference, but they're not, the universe isn't conspiring against you or me. It's, no one's trying to put these roadblocks in your way intentionally to slow you down. Mm -hmm. These things are just happening. Mm -hmm. And how you choose to look at those things ultimately determines your, your stress level. Wherever you are in the physical, make sure that's where you are in the mental and the emotional and the spiritual as well. And that's how I define being present. And it's so easy to get, you know, distracted from the past or anxious about the future. So what I like to say is we need to shrink our window. We, we need to, like even right now, right now you and I are making eye contact while we're recording this and I can see a little bit of a frame in my peripheral. That's all that I can see in my vision right now. I cannot see what's outside of this studio. I can't see what's going on in the rest of LA. I have shrunk my vision to the point where you are my focal point because you, deservedly so, have my full undivided attention right now. And we need to be able to shrink that window in other areas of life. So think about uh, six seconds left in the game. Phil Jackson draws up a play for Kobe Bryant. He needs to shrink that window. The only thing he needs to be worried about is executing that play to the best of his ability in order to score. He can't be worried about what's going on in the stands, what's going on with the opponents, what the referees may do. He can't be worried about what else is happening outside of the, the Staples Center. He has to shrink that window so that he can have razor sharp focus in that moment. And when we can learn to do that, basically on cue, then we improve our ability to focus and stress decreases accordingly. Shrink your focus and it allows you to be hyper present. Mm -hmm. And also for me, when that happens, I feel like things slow down rather than speed up. Is there a mechanism in that with high performers where under duress, things begin to slow down for them as they shrink their focus? Whereas someone who performs maybe at a not great level, things speed up somehow for them. Yeah, and the speed up comes from distractions. It's being okay. it's being worried about everything else that's going on. And that's, you know, in the in basketball vernacular, my goal when I was working with players was to get them to play present, which is play in the present moment. And there's, there's three components to being in the present. Um, first is just focus on the next play. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the play that just happened. Okay. Ed, you just missed the layup. Don't worry about it. Next play. Mm -hmm. Ed, you just turned the ball over. It's okay. Next play. Ed, I know the referee missed the call. It's over. Next play. Mm -hmm. See, if you're worried and you're you're wasting your emotional currency into the plays that just happened, then you're not able to put them into the current moment. 
which in basketball, at a, you know, playing at that type of pace means that if, if you're still pouting and dejected about the turnover, your man probably just scored two points now on the other end. So you just turned a two point mistake into a four point mistake. We all know we're gonna make mistakes, but we cannot be in the business of compounding them. We have to, we have to stop them after the first one. The second component is just to focus on what you have control over. Control the controllables, which I believe, if you break everything else down, is just our own attitude and effort. So just focus on the effort you're giving and the attitude that you're having to everything going on, in this case, during a basketball game. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of that is uh, to focus on the process. Uh, don't worry about the outcomes focus on the process. If it's the first quarter of the game, you can't be worried whether or not you're going to win or lose the game. Mm. All you need to worry about is winning or losing this possession. Mm. If we're on offense, can we get the best shot that we, the five of us, are capable of getting, the highest percentage shot? Mm. Or if we're on defense, can we collectively do everything we can to make you take the lowest percentage shot possible? Mm. And of course, the beautiful part is if you do that consistently enough, as legendary coach Bill Walsh said of the 49ers, the scoreboard takes care of itself. It's okay. And that's ultimately what the process is all about. So one other thing that the athletes I work with struggle with, and I think people do in business and in life and in relationships, is also projecting into the future. And then they have this conversation with themselves about, I'll give you an example, a golfer who's got a, a putt they should make, three foot putt to win a golf tournament. Where's the nerves come from? I believe oftentimes the nerves come from, believe it or not, this bizarre conversation of projection of, if I miss this putt, what will they say about me? If I miss this shot at the end of the game, what will they say about me? If my guy hits this shot on me in basketball, what will they say? And it's literally projecting into the future the negative emotions or feelings about what other people will actually say or think mm -hmm. about this mistake you may potentially make. What they're 100% consumed with is merely the outcome. Right. See, they've left the process. They're just worried about the outcome. Does the ball go in or not go in? Does the ball go in the cup or not go in the cup? Does she say yes when I ask her out or does she say no? When we can learn, and this is something that I've worked really hard on my, in my own life over the last couple of years, is learning how to detach from outcomes and just love the process and the work. And, and where we really have an issue is if outcomes and results actually define our self-worth, then we have a problem. You know, I, I know you're big on setting goals and we want to set, you know, uh, really big and aggressive goals. I'm a believer that if you set your goals appropriately, maybe you hit them 30, 40, 50% of the time. You don't hit them every time. If you're hitting your goal every time, then I could make a compelling argument that you've set the bar too low. Well, if your entire identity and self-worth and confidence and self-belief is wrapped up in outcomes and reaching goals and achievement, then that means half the time you feel good about yourself, half the time you feel lousy about yourself. And I don't know about you, but life's too short to feel lousy half of the time. Uh, if I was tasked with building a brick wall, which I most likely won't be because I'm not very handy, I'm not very good with building stuff, I'm not very good with tools, but I have confidence that I could build a brick wall. And the reason is I've trained myself to not worry about the end result, not worry about the wall, and put all of my focus into laying each and every brick with care and precision. If I can take one brick and set it exactly where it needs to go, and then I pick up the next brick and set it exactly where it needs to go. If I do that consistently over time, the wall just takes care of itself. I don't have to be worried about the wall. I have to focus on laying bricks. And that's also what I have control over is laying bricks. Now, from a basketball analogy, uh, I had an opportunity to work with Queens University as uh, one of the top Division II uh, men's basketball programs in the United States. And their previous coach, Bart Lundy, is a good friend of mine. And he has broken it down at Queens University that there are four key stats in the game of basketball that heavily impact whether or not they win the game. And the first stat is turnover differential. If we can have more possessions than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. Second is offensive rebound differential. If we can rebound our own misses and take more shots than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. Third is free throws attempted. It's the highest percentage shot per possession. If we can take more of those than our opponent, better chance to win. And last is three-pointers attempted. The three-pointer in the college game is a massive weapon. If we can take more clean looks from three than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. When Queens University comes out on top in those four stats, they win 97% of their games which means statistically they're almost unbeatable. So my, my rhetorical question for your millions of listeners is, what do you think Coach Lundy and his staff talk about, remind, and emphasize before every workout, every practice, every film session, and before every game? It's just those four things. Four things. He never talks about winning, championships, banners, or trophies. 
Why? If they do those four things, winning championship trophies and banners take care of themselves. You don't have to focus on them. So it's focusing on the things that we have the, the control over. And that goes back to, again, shrinking that window. I may use basketball examples because that's where I've spent most of my life. Mm -hmm. Folks need to take these and figure out how they can you know, apply them to their situation. Yeah. So step number one is figure out what, what does winning look like to you or what does success look like to you? Again, this could be in your marriage, this could be you know, in your business, this could be for something you're doing in your community, but figure out what does winning look like. Now, of course, in the game of basketball, which Simon Sinek has said is a, a finite game, and I'm a big fan of Simon's work, is a finite game. We have unanimously around the globe agreed that the team with the most points on the scoreboard when the final buzzer goes off is the winner. <laughs> right. Life, relationships, business, it's a little more esoteric. It's not as clear. How you might define winning in business might be slightly different than maybe one of your friends or colleagues, but that doesn't matter. You just have to get crystal clear on what winning looks like to you, and then you need to figure out what are the measurable building blocks, the yeah. bricks, if you will, that will allow me to reach that goal. And then once you have that North Star, take your eyes off of it and just focus on the bricks. Think, think about a, a GPS, which most people need to navigate the world these I, days. I don't yeah. know how I, I survived without I no one idea. beforehand. Right. Yeah. But you, you need to know two things. You need to know where you are in the moment, not where you were five minutes ago, five days ago, or five weeks ago. You need to know where you are right now, and you need to have an end address. Where am I going? Those are the only two points you need. And then once you have those two points, you don't need to worry about either one of them. What you need to do now is pay attention to the directions and listen to every turn that you're supposed to make. And of course, the beauty with this analogy is if you're like me and kind of directionally dysfunctional, you're probably going to take a wrong turn. And then what happens? It reroutes. It just reroutes. So the, the GPS doesn't get angry at you. It doesn't call you an idiot. It just simply reroutes and it puts you back on that course. And that's ultimately what all of us should be trying to do is pursue our North Star by focusing on the steps and directions it takes to get there. And when you misstep or you make a wrong turn, don't get upset over it. Just move to the next play and take the next direction to reroute. I think people are tired. I don't think they manage their energy very well. I watch this, even a basketball analogy. I've watched certain teams that, you know, I think, wow, they're tired. And I watch friends of mine in business and life. They just seem tired to me. So what is energy management and is, what are some of your keys for it? Well, we need to make sure we're protecting both time and energy. And, and, and as we know, I know you've said this on many previous shows, you know, obviously time is our most precious resource mm -hmm. because that is finite. Whenever that's done, that's done. We don't have any more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, energy is something though that we can actually replenish. And a lot of that has to do with, with our routines and our self-care. Are we making the time to fill our own buckets mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually so that we can keep that, that battery, that internal battery of our our lives mm. as close to 100% as possible. Mm. You know, most people would freak out if they looked down at their iPhone and saw their iPhone had three or 4% juice left in it. They'd immediately start looking for a plug or a right. Mophie or something, yeah. um, but they allow themselves to go down to three or 4% and they don't seem to do anything about it. And then you're just running on fumes and there's no way that you can be your best self or make a maximum contribution to the things that are important to you if you're doing that. So part of it comes down to our discernment of what are we going to invest our time and energy into? Mm -hmm. And and this goes back to uh, just two, two simple words, yes and no. What are you saying yes to and what are you saying no to? Mm -hmm. You know, as a self-diagnosed people pleaser, this was one that was really challenging for me most Same of my here. life. Me too. Because I love saying yes. Yeah. It feels good to say yes. Mm -hmm. I want to help as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that when I say yes to one thing, I am by default saying no to something else. If I'm going to say yes to investing this hour with you, that means this hour in time cannot be invested anywhere else. Now, this happens to be a wonderful investment of my time, one I'm very happy to make. So am I. But we have to be very careful of, of, of what we say yes and what we say no to. So we have to have some discernment. And for me, I've learned to be able to say no respectfully, uh, with tact, and to be polite. Um, if something is not a good fit. And how do we know if it's a good fit? Is it in alignment with the North Star that you're pursuing? If you're asking me to do something that is taking me away from that North Star, then it's most likely not the wisest investment of my time or energy and I'll politely decline. Mm -hmm. If what you're asking me to do is in alignment, then it's probably a great investment of my, my time and energy. So yeah. being able to, to step back and, and use our core values and use that North Star to design our lives and design our schedules and decide what we're going to say yes to is incredibly helpful. We can't we can't rely on feelings and emotions. If you're just saying yes and no to things based on your mood or how you're feeling, there's no consistency in that. You know what surprises me is how little people talk about visualization mm -hmm. and how much of it I do 
and how much of it happy and successful people, both happy and successful people that I know, spend in doing so. And so you talk about, it's not a lot, but you talk about in the book, visualization. One of the words that comes up in a lot of your shows and a lot of your work is intention. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure we're very intentional yeah. with what we're visualizing. Right. There were a few different research studies and I, I reference them in the book. The one that I liked the most um, from a visualization standpoint was they took three different groups and they were gonna have them shoot free throws. And these weren't professional players by any means. These okay. were just regular weekend warriors. And in the three groups, the first group, they got tested on the first day and then they practiced for 21 consecutive days and then they took the retest 21 days later. Okay. Second group took the test on the first day did not touch a basketball, but only visualized making free throws for the next 21 days and then took the retest. And then the third group tested on the first day, didn't practice and didn't visualize and then retested on the 21st day. I, gotta hear this. I think most people would realize the group that didn't practice or visualize, there was, there was no improvement. In fact, they had a slight decline in their ability. Okay. But the part that blew my mind was the group that visualized was only a couple of percentage points less than the group that actually practiced. Mm -hmm. So, so by actually sitting with your eyes closed and visualizing making free throws, it's almost as good as, as being able to practice. And that, that blows my mind. Now, I think we can also agree that the best thing to do is to do both, is to get in repetition, you know, uh, purposeful repetition, as well as visualize. I visualize before every single speaking engagement. Every engagement I do, I always arrive the day before and I request to see the room the day before I'm going to speak. I want to get a feel for what it's going to look like. I visualized before I came in here with you today. I watched several of your other guests uh, on YouTube who were in this studio. I knew what this room looked like before I set foot in here, which gave me a certain level of comfort that I wasn't going to walk into anything that I hadn't, hadn't prepared myself for. And one of my favorite quotes that I learned from a mentor of mine is make preparation your separation. And that I wanna be as prepared as possible for everything that I do. I got hurt my sophomore year of college and I couldn't play. And we had a team psychologist at the time. He ended up being killed, and I, I use a lot of his work to this day. He was in a car accident. I use a lot of his work, and I get a lot of credit for it because he was so cutting edge even back in those days. And he said, Ed, here's what we're going to do. And I hit 215 my freshman year. Terrible year. That's terrible. And then I sat out because I was hurt. The next year, I hit almost 380, and I wasn't any better of a hitter. What happened was he taught me to visualize, and we'd sit behind the batting cage where the other guys were popping some up, grounding into double plays, missing a few. He said, Ed, you're going to hit a line drive up the middle thousands of times. And he made me focus on my visualization. So he goes, Ed, all right, visualize you hitting the line drive up the middle. I go, I got it. And he'd go, okay, really? Do you? And he would make me hyper visualize. He'd say, Ed, where's the camera? I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, how are you seeing it? From what angle? Is the camera in the center field, like on TV, over the pitcher's head, shooting in? Or is it from the batter's box, your view out? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, well, then you kind of should know. And I go, okay, uh, actually turns out the camera's on me. I'm looking out at the pitcher. He goes, great, not everybody has it that way. He goes, can you see the release point? Can you see the stitches on the ball? Can you see the rotating? And it got to the point where he go, what is it? And I say, it's a curveball. He goes, how do you know? I could see the dot on the stitches, right? And then I could see, I got to the point where he'd make me work. I could see then the stitches coming in. I could see the ball hit the bat and the stitches re-rotating backwards the other way, right back over the guy's left shoulder. I just gotta share this with you. So I come back, I'm a 215 hitter, the first day in BP. First pitch throw to me is up and away, and I swat at it and hit a line drive up the middle. Next ball, down and away. Line drive up the middle. And I think it was 28 straight hits. My teammates are like, what's going on with my let? Yeah. Line drive up the middle every single time. Then I popped one up, and I hit like 16 more up the middle. I had not swung a bat in six months. But the upside to that was I didn't have any negative experiences from actually swinging the bat. And the subconscious mind really doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. I share this because your work is so good, bro. And the people that are listening to this, if you would start to visualize and then get better at it, refine it, see it more clearly. Can you slow it down? Can you speed it up? Can you add color? Can you add sound? And the more you get good at visualizing, you're gonna change your damn life, the better you get at this. So I just wanted to add, second it, and add to it that I have a real life experience. And to this day, things like getting to the studio and visualizing it, I do that crazy stuff too, because it's not crazy. All right, chapter five. Never heard it said this way. Using stress. So usually people are taught avoid stress, minimize stress, and you have strategies for that in the book as well. But sometimes you're almost like, hey, dance with it. Use this stress. What does that mean? That goes back to something we said earlier. It's kind of the difference between viewing something that's making you nervous versus viewing something that gets you really, really excited. I mean, I've, I, I said to you before off air, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work. You've had a massive impact on my life. Uh, 
I could have been nervous coming in here and to meet you for the first time and sit, but instead, I was excited for this opportunity. Like, so and, was I. And, and those, though, they can have very similar feelings. They can have, you can have the butterflies in your stomach, you know, and I don't remember who said that originally, but if you ever feel butterflies in your stomach, just get them all lined up in the same direction so that they can <laughs> work, good. they can work for you. Um, but we do, we, we need, we need to have some stress in our life. If the stress is overwhelming, then you'll be completely debilitated. If I was completely overwhelmed with stress right now, this wouldn't be much of an interview. Mm. However, if there was zero stress, I'd probably be bored and there wouldn't be much of an interview. So we want just enough to keep us sharp. It's very similar to fear. You know, fear in and of itself keeps us safe. We want to have some fear. If not, we just walk in the middle of traffic or we just juggle knives or do something foolish. But if, if we have too much fear, then we become paralyzed and we can't actually do anything. So yeah, these things help, they help keep us sharp. So we want to have a little bit, be on a little bit of edge for the things that mean the most to us. And you have in the book three steps to changing and they're basic. I'll read them to you and then I want you to elaborate on them. Please. Okay. Awareness, understanding, and reconditioning. What does all that mean? We're never going to improve something we're unaware of and we're never going to improve something we're oblivious to. So the first step is having an awareness and acknowledgement that something actually needs to change. That whatever I'm doing, I, I need to make a change to. You know, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you will keep getting what you've been getting. If you don't like what you've been getting, you need to change what you've been doing. I mean, that's as, as simple as it gets. You know, another one of my favorite quotes, arguably my favorite is, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So we have to <laughs> so lean good. into change. And there's two types of change. There's change that's imposed on us, perfect example would be a two-year global pandemic right uh, but right. then there's change that's initiated and that's what we're talking about here we need to be the ones to drive that change so first is awareness what do I need to change second is I need to have an understanding of what's at risk if I don't make this change leverage. if you're getting leverage absolutely yep. and I need to have an understanding so what, what what am I risking by not changing this behavior if I continue to do this for the rest of my life what's at risk and many times the answer to that is happiness fulfillment uh, maxing out your potential, all those types of things. And then lastly, we just need to be able to recondition uh, the behavior or the process, the system that will allow that to happen. So we don't want to just go in and, and start swinging in the dark. We want to actually map out an actual plan of how we can make make change. What's and, reconditioning mean though? How, 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 so you back up the plan. Is reconditioning this some form of reinforcement when you do it correctly? Or how do you condition something in yourself? So uh, let's just use a relationship for example. You okay. say your relationship is getting a little bit stale with your significant other mm -hmm. and you take a look at well here are the things I've been doing which has led to a stale relationship. Mm -hmm. So I've conditioned myself to these being my default habits. You know whatever they may be. Uh, I don't look at my significant other when she's talking to me. I'm staring at my phone. Uh, I used to leave her little notes around the house but I no longer do that like I fall into these these lesser habits and that's what's producing a stale relationship if I want to have a better relationship then I need to recondition my habits I need to go back to doing the things that I know I need to do to get to that and and I also have a three-step formula for how someone can do that uh, ab absolutely and I got to continue to make the disclaimer that this is incredibly basic but none of the stuff you and I have been talking about is easy not, not a single thing we've said is easy to actually do. If it was easy, people wouldn't even need to listen to this because they're already doing, doing it. it. Yeah, so we know through our own experiences these things are hard. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to have razor sharp focus and isolate it down to one behavior that you want to focus on changing. One of the problems many people make is they try to change a bunch of things at once. Gosh. And as human beings, we're, we're wired to have singular type focus. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with John Berardi. He started Precision Nutrition, mm. really smart guy in the fitness world. And he did an expansive research study, similar to the one with free throws. But he found that when folks isolated their focus into one behavior to change, they actually successfully changed that behavior 85% of the time. The moment they split it and tried to change two behaviors at the same time, success rate went down to 40%. Mm. And if they tried to chase three behaviors at the same time, it went down to about four or five percent. So I know that a lot of people that listen to your show are high achievers. They're driven. They're ambitious. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm saying it's in your best interest to just focus on one thing that you're going to change. Then the next step is make a commitment to yourself to do that for 66 straight days. Now, I know the research is all over the place on how long it takes to form a habit. You know, it could be anywhere from 21 days to nine months, but I like 66 days because one, it's easy to remember. Two, it's enough of a stretch, but it's also doable. It's a hair over two months, okay. but make a commitment to doing that for 66 straight days. 
And then the third is you want to keep the spotlight of accountability on yourself. And you do that by recruiting people that care about you and ask them to hold you accountable. So let's put this into a practical uh, scenario. You've got someone listening right now that wants to get into a little bit better physical health. Uh, they haven't been working out very much. Instead of changing everything, instead of upending their diet, buying a Peloton bike, signing up for a yoga membership, yeah. you know, just pick one thing. And let's say they say, I'm going to go for a walk for 30 minutes every morning. That's it. I'm not changing anything else in my life. I'm going to walk for 30 minutes. I'm going to then commit to doing that for 66 straight days. I'm old school. I like to print out paper calendars and take a red Sharpie. And every day you go for that walk, I want you to put a big red X and I want you to go until you got 66 X's in a row. And if you miss a day because you're human, move to the next play. Just start that streak again the next day. And then I want you to reach out to three or four people that you know love you and care about you and want to see you happy and successful. And you tell them, I'm going to go for a walk every day for 30 minutes. And I'm asking you, Ed, I want you to check in with me. I want you to send me a text every day at lunch and ask if I went for a walk. Ask me what I'm listening to or ask me what route I took, but I want you to hold me accountable. And if three or four people do that, you know, what, one of the emotions that, that really hurts most of us is feeling like we disappoint someone that, that we care about. And if you can do those things, you pick one thing, you do it for 66 days and you get people holding you accountable. I'm not a gambler, Ed, but I'll put my money, I'll put all my chips on the middle of the table saying you will improve that habit. Very and then the good. beautiful thing is at the end of 66 days, then you just stack another habit on top of you that. You do the next one. Yeah. And then yep. you say, okay, if we're sticking with this theme, uh, now for the next 66 days, I'm going to reduce uh, sugar or I'm going to reduce, you know, sweets or soda, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So you don't stop doing the first one. So now for the next 66 days, you keep walking for 30 minutes and you're going to eliminate say junk food and then 66 days later you add something else so by the end of the calendar year you've changed four or five things in your life you'll be a completely different person at the end of that year 100%. and the only difference is instead of deciding to do all five of those things on january 1st you're going to pick them off one at a time yeah. and then they're going to stick yeah because you've got, you've increased your execution rate from 80 percent to down to less than four percent especially if you're doing five you know i'm watching you I watch people very closely in every aspect of my life, but it also happens certainly when I interview them because it's just you and I in the room. And I said this earlier, you own your content, it's reflexive. There's not even hesitation when I ask you a question. You own this, you live this stuff. And I like authentic people. Thank you. I like people who live the things that they teach because I can feel a different energy from them when they teach it. I can feel. What is different with that one millionth of one percentile compared to really good people in anything, do you think? What's the separator? I'll give you an example with KD and I'll give you an example with Curry. Okay. KD does a masterful job of blending humility uh, with confidence. Uh, you won't find a more confident offensive player. Why is he confident? He's earned the right to be arguably the best scorer in the game because of the time he's put in during the unseen hours. However, he blends that with humility, which means he is open to feedback and he's open to coaching. He doesn't think that he's reached the ceiling of what he's capable of. So if you have something, a coach or someone or a trainer has something that can actually make him better, he is all ears. He is open to that. So he's a killer from a confidence standpoint. He believes he's going to score. He believes he's the best player on the court but he never lets that override his humility. He stays open to coaching and open to feedback, which is why every step along the way, he continues to get better. Okay. So blending confidence with humility is one. My favorite uh, people have that nuance, by the way. Absolutely, yeah, totally. absolutely. And, and Curry, um, Curry does not let what happened previously affect what happens presently. I, I say this in the book, and I, I find this both comical, but, but an powerful, uh, powerful lesson. If I had a quarter right now and I flipped it and seven times in a row it was heads, what's the percentage chance it'll be heads on the eighth 50, flip? It should be 50%. Of still. course it is. Yeah, yeah, but most people don't right. think that. Most yeah. people think, oh, it's got to be a higher percentage to be tails because he just did it. No, the quarter has no idea. That's right. The quarter doesn't know what the first seven flips were. Every time you flip a coin, it is 50-50. Why do I say that? Because it, it happens very rarely because he is the greatest shooter of all time. But Stephen Curry, uh, statistically, you can look it up, has missed the first seven shots he's taken in a game. What makes him Stephen Curry is he shoots the eighth shot with the confidence as if he had made the previous seven. I he, love he that. He does not let the previous seven misses. He doesn't bring that baggage with him mm -hmm. and, and, and so affect the current shot. And what, that is what a life lesson. And that is so hard to do, though. Yeah. I mean, you, yep. you know, it's, it's easy for you and I to sit here and, and talk about mm -hmm. it is hard because the tendency is to flash back and go, oh, my gosh, I've missed seven in a row. What happens if I miss this? What are people going to think about me? Yep. Am I going to let my team down? He wipes all of that clear. Every single shot is its own shot. 
you know, and it's it's the difference with when you take a player like Kobe. I would say this all the time to young players I'd work with. You know, mediocre players they go to the gym to take 500 shots a day. Okay. Good players go to the gym to make 500 shots a day. There's a difference. You know, we don't we don't need more shot takers. We need shot makers. Great players, elite players like Stephen Curry, they go into the gym to make one shot 500 separate times. And that that nuanced difference, this is not verbal semantics. There is a difference between that. Steph's not in the gym thinking, oh man, I still got 419 shots left to shoot. No, all I care about in the world is this one shot right now. Perfect footwork, perfect form, and then he moves to the next shot. And then that's the only one that matters. And that's, that's again, these are lessons that all of us can apply to what we do. What about Kobe? What separated him? Preparation? Preparation, I think, I mean, words like relentless, words like obsessed. I mean, he, he made no bones about the fact that he wanted to be considered the greatest player to ever play the game. Yeah. And, and some people are wired that way. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not wired that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not concerned with being the best. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with being my best. Yeah. And if I'm my best, just let the chips fall where they may. That's that part of self-awareness, though. And my, my, maybe that's why I hold him in higher regard than a LeBron, who's clearly incredible, or yeah. Kareem, or Will. Maybe just because I just, there's something noble about the just relentless pursuit of the greatness that he had in the work ethic. This has been an outstanding, Alan. Thank outstanding. Equally for me. One of my favorite baseball players as a Red Sox fan is Wade Boggs. Oh, yeah. And so Wade was fam was famous for a lot of things, which is a great hitter. But one of the things he's famous for is dude ate chicken before every single game. He sure did. He had this routine that he did it before every single game. But in, you mention him under the category of the role of belief. And in my life, I really believe that belief drives almost everything. In my book, I talk about the chapter in my book called The Matrix, which is belief. With that which you believe most strongly, the world reveals to you. Mm -hmm. You'll begin to see things and hear things that always existed, but will confirm the beliefs that you have. And so what is the role of belief in being a peak or elite performer? Well, it's irrelevant whether or not chicken is the best thing to eat before you play baseball. He believed that it was, and he believed that it contributed to his ability to hit the baseball. So that's all that matters. That's how powerful belief is. I mean, we you, you could probably interview 10 nutritionists, and they would all say that fried chicken is not the best thing to eat before <laughs> athletic performance, but it doesn't matter right. because he believed that it was. And he also understood the power of consistency, the power of routine, uh, power of structure, you know, and, and same thing. I mean, uh, if, if LeBron was going to have a game tonight, uh, three hours before tip-off, he would not be walking around the streets of LA wondering what he was going to eat. This is all premeditated. These are things that they've, these, these peak performers have honed through trial and error and have figured out when I eat this at this time, I perform at my best. And, you know, and that routine will change over time. I promise you, LeBron's pregame routine now is not the same it was when he was a rookie with the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's matured, it's evolved, it's grown. And all of us need to have routines. I have a pre speaking routine that I follow relentlessly. It's slightly different whether I'm giving an 8 a.m. keynote or an 8 p.m. keynote, but I have structure and routine, and that gives me comfort, and then that allows me to go out and perform my best. Everyone, uh, follow Alan. Go get Sustain Your Game. Go buy The Power of One More, my great book. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. So if you like this episode and you love Ed's show as much as I do, share it with somebody else. It doesn't take anything away from you. All you're doing is lighting other people's candles, which is what we should all be in the business of doing. So thank you, Ed. This was amazing.